Today we're unpacking the topic uh, rejection. We're talking about rejection. And if you've ever experienced rejection in your life, you can um, relate that it is one of the most soul-crushing, devastating things that you can experience. And um, I remember being in third grade and experiencing rejection. I was um, in class, and there was this girl. She was very popular, right? So I had a crush on this girl in third grade. She was a, one of the popular kids. I don't know if I really, like, had a crush on her or whether I was just, you know, excited about being with someone who was popular in, in the class. And so I'm like, if I can get with her, what's that say about me? <laughs> so, I, you know, I wanted to pursue her. And I remember one, one night I got home and I was like, I got to shoot my shot. Like, enough is enough. I got to let this girl know that, I, that I'm interested in her. I got a crush on her. And so I'm, I'm sitting at home. I've been in my room, and I'm like, I'm going to write her a note. All right, so I'm going to write her a note. So I got, I got my notebook, paper out, and I'm writing this note. And I'm like, dear love, comma. Nah, that ain't right. Let me rip that up, throw that out. Uh, dear sexy young thing. Nah, nah, that ain't right. All right. So, so I'm writing this note. I'm, I'm trying to craft my words exactly, trying to convey that I have an interest in this girl. And then I wrapped up the note with the infamous, uh, will you be my girlfriend in circle, yes or no? And so after I wrote this note, I stayed up all night to write this note. I folded it up real nice. You know, this is back when we passed notes and we had different origami shapes and things that we could um, wrap these notes up in. So I wrapped it up real nice. I got excited to go to school the next day. I get to the classroom super early. I'm the first one there. Nobody else is there. I'm like, I'm a, I, so my seat was in the front of the class. Her seat was in the, in the back of the class. I knew exactly where she sat. And in my mind, I had it all mapped out, right? So I put the note on her desk, and I went to go sit at my seat, which is in the front of the class. And I didn't really think this through. I'm going to be honest. I think I had in my mind that when I got to school, I'd be the first one there, and she'd be the second person there. And so I was sitting at my desk, and then she was sitting at her desk. She opens the note. She looks at me. I kind of look back at her. We kind of lock eyes. And I'm like, you know what it is. And she's like, yeah, I know what it is. And then we stand up and we do this thing where we're now, now we're together. That's how I thought it was going to play out in my mind. It didn't really happen that way. The note was sitting on her desk. All these unruly kids start coming in, snotty noses and everything. I'm like, what y'all doing here? So everybody's running in the class, running around. I'm like, oh, my goodness, I didn't think this through. Somebody's going to take the note off her desk. And you know how kids are. They're going to read it. They're going to read it, and then they're going to start making fun of me. I'm like, oh, man, this is a mistake. Why did I do this? So I'm sitting there. My hands is getting sweaty. I'm like, ah, I don't know what to do. All these kids are running around. They didn't see the note. And then she walks in. She walks in, and then her friends come in. So now it's her and her friends coming in, and they go to her seat. She picks up the note, and I know she's going to read it in front of her friends. So I'm like, ah! This is not going according to plan, but I'm playing it cool, even though I'm sweating everywhere. I'm playing it cool. She takes the note back to her friends, and I didn't hear anything from her for the rest of the day. And I'm crushed. I'm like, this is like, what did I do? Paul, you so stupid. Like, why would you do that? Who writes notes? Then the end of the day gets there, and I'm sitting at the desk. I'm feeling down. I'm waiting for the bell to ring so we could just go home. I'm just, I want this day to be over. Sitting at my desk, some of my friends was next to me kind of kicking it with my boys, but I'm, I'm out of it. I'm, I'm kind of depressed, so I have, I have my head kind of laying down on my desk. I'm like, yeah, 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 you know, and then all of a sudden, she walks toward me with like a conglomerate of her friends. They're like walking towards me, boom, 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 and I'm like, mm-mm. I ain't never doing this again. And so she steps up to me. She comes up to me. She turns to me. She sees that my head is laying down. At this point, I'm not trying to make any eye contact. I'm acting like I don't know what's going on. So she looks at me. She lifts up my head, and she kisses me on the forehead. And then she hands me back that note. And so I'm like, hold up. Everybody sees it. The most popular girl in school just kissed me on my forehead. Everybody's like, oh, oh, oh. 
I look at the note she had circled. No, I put that thing in my pocket, and I was like, I ain't saying nothing. I got me a kiss. Rejected with a kiss. Regular old Judas. <laughs> so I was rejected, and I was kind of let down in a nice way. She didn't have to kiss me. That was nice of her, right? It was a no, but it was like a, you know, I ain't going to make you feel too bad. And I held on to that kiss. I think we ended up dating or being whatever you are in third grade to each other um, at some point. <laughs> but, but I remember that feeling of, of seeing that no. It stung. Ouch. Saying, I'm not good enough for you. But rejection is, is a powerful thing, and it's not always as light as my third grade story. Many of us have experienced a soul-crushing form of rejection, a, a rejection that is so devastating. It's, it's something that you want to bury so deep that you just wish that nobody would uncover. Rejection is painful. And in Genesis chapter 15, we're about to read the story of Joseph and how he faced similar Rejection, not of my third great story, but the soul crushing kind of rejection. We're going to start at the end of his story in Genesis chapter 50, verse 14. Are you glad you came to church today? Let's go. It says this in Genesis chapter 50, verse 14. It says, After burying Jacob, Jacob is Joseph's father. It says, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had accompanied him to his father's burial. But now that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers became fearful. Now Joseph will show his anger and pay us back for all the wrong we did to him, they said. It goes on to say, so they sent this message to Joseph. Before your father died, he instructed us to say to you, please forgive your brothers for the great wrong they did to you, for their sin in treating you so cruelly. So we, the servants of of the God of your father, beg you to forgive our sin. And when Joseph received the message, he broke down and he wept. It continues that then his brothers came and threw themselves down before Joseph. Look, we are your slaves, they said. But Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? And he goes on and he says this statement. He says, you intended to harm me. Can we repeat that together on the count of three? One, two, three. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. Let's try that again. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. It goes on and says, he brought me to this position so that I could save the lives of many people today. As we unpack rejection, I want to talk from the topic, the reason for rejection. The reason for rejection. There is a reason for the rejection that you experience in life. However, your interpretation of the reason for your rejection is key for you to discern and unpack. And there are many interpretations, many ways that you can interpret the rejection that happens in your life and in my life and I had this rejection in third grade, but that isn't the only form of rejection that I've experienced. I've experienced a type of rejection that was a little more soul-crushing for me as well. Have you ever had people show up for you? and or have, have you ever showed up for people in a way that they didn't show up for you? You're the one that uh, you always show up for someone, but... For some reason, when it comes to your thing and and your time, when you need someone to show up for you, it's like no one is there to be found. And I experienced that kind of rejection, and I experienced this kind of rejection from, from my father. My father battled addiction with drugs all of his life, even still to this day, and I'm proud of his progress today. I love my dad and and all that he has had to go through. But when I was young, I didn't really understand the nature of addiction. I didn't understand the chemical imbalance that an addiction presents to your brain and how it alters your decision making. I didn't understand any of that. All I knew is my dad was was making a choice and I thought that choice just wasn't me. And so I I felt abandoned by my dad. I I felt alone. And all throughout my life I had this feeling of loneliness where I just felt like 
I really didn't have anybody in my corner. I grew up in a large family. My great-grandfather had 17 kids. Those 17 kids had about 150 kids, and then those kids had kids, and, and those kids' kids are my cousins, and, and we grew up together like brothers and sisters, and I had a large family. I grew up with my sister, who was my ride or die. I was never really alone, but I always felt this persistent feeling of loneliness. And it wasn't until after I got married that, that, that I, I began to unpack this and really trace it back to this feeling of rejection because abandonment is a form of rejection. In, in Joseph's life, we see Joseph's story actually starts in Genesis chapter 37 where his brothers are around and he gets this dream. Now, we just read the end of the story because this is the dream that he had. This is the fulfillment of the dream where he had a dream when he was a teenager that his brothers would be coming to him and bowing down before him. And he would have this place of prestige and position. But he shares this big dream with his family and his family's like, what's wrong with you? And they started to hate Joseph. His brothers started to, to not like him. They couldn't stand Joseph. But the dream wasn't Joseph's fault. Have you ever shared a big dream or a big vision with someone and they mad at you like you're the one that gave yourself the vision? <laughs> this vision didn't come from me. This vision didn't come from Joseph. God gave that vision to Joseph. God gave that dream to Joseph. But they started to not like him. They started to hate him even. So his brothers get so upset with Joseph, they want to kill him. So they take Joseph and they go with plans to kill him. And they end up throwing him into a pit. And it was in that pit that Joseph began to experience firsthand rejection. And rejection can feel much like living in a pit where you feel like there's no way out of this. This is now my, my new identity. This is now my new normal. And I don't know how to get out of this. Now, he goes from this pit. They take him out of the pit, and they go, you know what? Why don't we just sell him away, sell him off? There's some traders that are coming by. Let's sell him to these merchants. They sell him to these merchants. The merchants take him to Egypt, and they end up selling him to a guy named Potiphar. Potiphar becomes his master. He's a teenager at this point, probably around 17 or 18 years old. Potiphar takes him in. And it seems like everything's fine. He's working for Potiphar. But then Potiphar's wife gets an idea that he want, she wants to sleep with Joseph. So she tries to sleep with Joseph. Joseph says no. And she gets upset. And then she lies on Joseph, tells her husband Potiphar, this man tried to sleep with me. So Potiphar is upset. How could you do this? I brought you into my house. I treated you well, and you tried to sleep with my wife. Now Potiphar throws Joseph into a prison, and Joseph is now alone. Joseph has been abandoned by everyone who loves him. He's alone. He feels rejected, and now he is in a prison. He goes from the pit of rejection into a prison of what feels like abandonment. Many of you, whether you feel like you're in a pit of rejection or whether you feel like you are in a prison of what feels like abandonment, God has a message for you today. And I want you to take a look at what it says in Genesis chapter 39, verse 21. It says this, it says, but the Lord was with Joseph in what? The prison and showed him his faithful love. I came here to tell you today that whether you're in the pit, sometimes we feel like, God, why don't you rescue me from this pit? God will sometimes rescue you from the pit, but what about when you're in a prison? It's not always the case that God will rescue you from the prison of abandonment. Sometimes God will step into the prison with you and assure you of his presence. And many of you are in a prison where you feel abandoned, you feel alone. And God sent me here to tell you that you're not alone. He has not abandoned you. He's with you in that prison. And he's here to show you his faithful love. I want to talk to some people who have experienced rejection and abandonment by even the people who were supposed to be the ones who cared about you the most. God loves you, and he's here to show you his faithful love today. Now, some people 
are lonely because they struggle to make social connections. Some people are socially awkward. But then others are alone because they're afraid of the pit of rejection that comes when you put yourself out there. Did you know that Atlanta was, one of the, was named one of the loneliest cities in the U.S.? It was the Chamber of Commerce that, that looked into housing data across um, over 170 cities. And, and what they found is that in all of these findings that Atlanta is one of the loneliest cities in the country. And it really doesn't make much sense. A few years ago, I did some research into the population data. And um, back when I did that, Atlanta's metro population was about 5.7 million people. And at that time, that was over four years ago. So obviously things have grown and people have come. We fool, by the way. <laughs> But isn't it interesting that for a, a, a place like Atlanta that is so populated where everybody's coming from all over the place, it's still the loneliest city? I wonder why that is. And the reality is that you can be in a room full of people. You can be the life of the party and you can still feel empty inside. You can still feel alone. But I want you to nudge your neighbor and say, but the Lord is with you. And he's here to show you his faithful love. I'm going to give you four things that you need to know about rejection. And I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would receive this today. God has a message for you. Here's the four things that you need to know about rejection. Here's the first thing. Rejection was never God's intention. Those of you who have experienced rejection, I need you to know this. Rejection was never God's intention. We're going to do a lot of talking today, so I need you to say something with me today. I want you to say that statement on the count of three. One, two, three. Rejection was never God's intention. I need you to really say it like you believe it. Rejection was never God's intention. I wish I had at least three people that wouldn't mind standing and saying it today. On the count of three. One, two, three. Rejection was never God's intention. I really don't believe that you believe this. Say it again until we really believe it together. On the count of three. One, two, three. Re the enemy wants you to believe that rejection was what was intended for your life. And I need you to uproot the lies of the enemy today. If we're going to unpack rejection, the first thing I need you to see is that rejection was never God's intention. Now, I want to show you this in the story of Joseph, in the life of Joseph, because many of us, we gloss over this part in Joseph's story, but I think this part in Joseph's story is so profound, because did you know that it was never intended that Joseph would have been sold into slavery? It was never intended for Joseph to be sold into slavery. It was never intended for him to stay in that pit. He had an other older brother named Reuben, and I want you to read this with me. In Genesis 37 and 29, it says, Sometime later, Reuben returned to get Joseph out of the cistern. But when he discovered that Joseph was missing, he tore his clothes in grief. What I want you to see today is that Reuben never intended for Joseph to stay in that pit or be sold into slavery. He told his brothers to put him in the pit so that they wouldn't kill him, but he had intentions of going back to the pit to get Joseph out of the pit and to take him back to his father's house. Joseph didn't know any of that. The only thing that Joseph experienced was being sold into slavery, being sold to Potiphar, and now being thrown into a prison. He had no idea that one of his brothers loved him enough to come back and try to get him out of the pit. And I'm here to tell you today that the narrative that you're telling yourself about your rejection isn't all the way true. You said, why would God do this to me? God didn't do that to you. Why would God intend this for my life? God didn't intend that for your life. Rejection is never God's intention. But we live in a broken world. We live in a society where there are people who reject the truth about God. They reject the love of God. And in turn, they make terrible decisions that impact us. Reuben returned to get Joseph. 
Joseph didn't know that while he was being sold into slavery, somebody was grieving over his absence. He thought all of his brothers rejected him and disowned him. But he had one brother that was sad and grieving and heartbroken. He had no idea. I want you to know that everything that happened to Joseph in his life, do you realize he did nothing to cause it, to, to start that? It was none of it was his fault. And I want to talk to some of the people in the room where you're going, what did I do to deserve this? I didn't do anything to deserve this, this rejection. I didn't do anything to deserve this. What's wrong with me? None of this was Joseph's fault. Somebody came back to get him out of that pit, but he had already been gone. And he gets into this prison, and the Lord is with him in the prison. Rejection was never God's intention. There are some of you in the room today who have a, what I like to call, a I'm good ministry. You ever heard of that? Well, this is the kind of ministry that, um, where you don't need nobody, you don't want nobody, you good, like, you're the one that someone tries to bring up something and it may have impacted you. I'm good. I, I, I'm good on that. I don't need no relationships. I don't need nobody to help me. I don't need to depend on nobody. Depending on people is draining and weary and I don't got time for it. I'm good. Where are my I'm good ministry people at? <laughs> uh, I, I was, I was, uh, I think I was uh, the pastor of the uh, I'm good ministry for a long time in my life. Because I just thought, I'm good. I left home at the age of 17, and I lived in Pennsylvania, moved to Boston, and I just, I'm good. I figure it out. And for those of you who are in here, and if you've experienced rejection, and you have an I'm good ministry, I got to tell you something. You're not good. It will be good. But as long as you're ignoring and suppressing and burying that pain of rejection, you're not good. I love you enough to tell you that. People who experience rejection and, and have that I'm good ministry, the way that you can tell that they're not good is they have something called rejection sensitivity. Rejection sensitivity is characterized by three things. The first thing is facial expressions. When you start to see people's facial expressions and you interpret those expressions as rejection. Why are they looking at me like that? Did I say something wrong? What happened? Oh, they don't like me? All because you see somebody's facial expression not be what you think it should be in the moment. So facial expressions can communicate to you a sense of rejection, but that's called rejection sensitivity. That's how you know I'm not good. <laughs> Here's the second thing, attention bias. Attention bias is this. Attention bias is when you have a bias towards the negative feedback that you receive. And you internalize the one negative thing that someone has to say about you, but you've received 20 other compliments and you can't see or hear those compliments. The only thing that you want to turn your attention towards and you have a bias towards is that one negative thing. We want to forget everything else that people have to say except for that one thing. The third rejection insensitivity, insensitivity is observation vigilance. Some of us have an incessant need to observe the behaviors of other people and, and to try to interpret what those behaviors are and are not. So what it, what it means is you sit back and you watch the way other people behave and you try to connect dots that are actually unconnected and, and you're trying to put things together that are actually, they have nothing to do with each other, but you think you're wise because you're able to sit back and observe. Ah, you see what they did? Last week, I don't know if you noticed, but they did this. And because they did that last week, you know what that means, but they did this week. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to put a puzzle together because you want to protect yourself from everything that you don't understand because you're afraid of being rejected. Now, this happens because of different reasons. Some of us have had overly critical parents growing up. 
Some of us have experienced abandonment and bullying and neglect. Maybe you've experienced every single one of those things. So you're sensitive about rejection. I just sense, even in this moment, I sense that God wants to heal your heart today. You're in this room today, and God is speaking to your heart about the pain of rejection, and you have buried it so deep that you actually don't even acknowledge it as rejection anymore. That thing that has been, been with you all this time, am I good enough? Will anybody ever want me? God is here to tell you about his, unfa- his, his faithful love. So here's the second thing I want to tell you. The second thing is this. Rejection is not a reflection of your worth. Rejection is not a reflection of your worth. I told you we was going to talk a lot today, so I want you to internalize that and say, rejection is not a reflection of my worth. On the count of three. One, two, three. Rejection is not a reflection of my worth. Rejection is not a reflection of my worth. One more time. Rejection. The enemy wants to convince you. That the rejection that you've experienced, the abandonment that you have encountered, is a reflection of value. You are only worth that. That's why you've experienced that. He wants to tell you that, that this is who you are. Nobody wants you because you're worthless. And those lies that have been plaguing you all of your life and you've been building a life on rejection and a a sense of worthlessness because of that rejection. I'm here to defy and to come against the lies of the enemy and to tell you that rejection is not a reflection of your worth. 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 Your worth. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are the head. You're not the tail. God has great plans for your life. And I come against those lies today. Let me prove it to you because some of you are going, I don't know about that. I kind of feel like this is all, this is all I'm worth. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. Starting in the fourth verse, it says this. It says, you are coming to Christ, who was the living cornerstone cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people. Stop. I want you to stop right there. I want you to take this in. Jesus, who was the Savior of the world, he is God, fully God. He was rejected by people. If the logic that you have about your worth is based on they rejected me so that must mean that I am worthless. By your logic, then Jesus is nothing but a reject. When you build your worth on the foundation of how people treat you and then you treat yourself the way they treat you, you are building your worth on a faulty foundation. Jesus was rejected by people. That doesn't mean that he's a rejection. He was rejected by people, but look what it says. But he was chosen by God for great honor. And then he goes on to say, and you are living stones. So Jesus is the chief cornerstone, and you are also living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. He says, what's more, you are his holy priests. Through the, through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. Somebody say, I please God. <laughs> I'm not a reject. I'm a holy priest. Don't believe those lies that have been chasing you down and haunting you all of your life. Jesus was rejected by people. We will experience rejection 
Sometimes that rejection will throw you into a pit. Sometimes it will put you in a prison of abandonment. But whether you're in a pit or a prison, God is here to let you know that he is faithful and he has accepted you. I'm going to give you the third thing about rejection. And this is, this is where it, you got to really pay attention because here's what happens. We experience rejection, and then what we do with that rejection is of critical importance because we have two options. You can either, either take the rejection and you can place it into the hand of the enemy, or you can take that rejection and you can place it into the hand of God. Let me tell you the difference between the two. Here's the third thing. The enemy uses rejection for the purposes of isolation and retaliation. The enemy wants to take that rejection when you place it into his hands, and he wants to send you into a place of isolation. He doesn't want you to trust anyone. He doesn't want you to get close to anyone. He doesn't want you to get connected to life-giving relationships that can heal your heart from the pain of rejection that you've experienced. He doesn't want any of that for your life. And he wants you to retaliate when you get to a place of power and position. He wants you to pay back what was done to you. That's what the enemy wants you to do when you place rejection into his hands. But there's a reason for rejection when you place it into the hand of God. Here's the fourth thing. God uses rejection for the purposes of protection and redirection. When you place rejection into the hand of God, what you begin to realize is that because you have rejected me, God was just protecting me. Because you have rejected me, God was just sending me on a detour. He still has a plan for my life. He still has a hope and a future for me. And I'm not going to allow the enemy to get into my mind because what you intended to harm me, God intended for my good. Genesis 50 and 20, Joseph said, you brothers, you, you intended to harm me, but God had a plan for, for that rejection. He was protecting me. He was redirecting me. He's the one that's ordering my steps. Nobody who is rejecting you has control over your destiny, only God. <laughs> Joseph's story in, in, in the book of Genesis, did you know this, that in five books of the law, Joseph's story is, is, is the longest character story in all of Genesis. It's longer than Adam, than, 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 than Noah, than, than Abraham, Moses. You read those people who were prominent figures in the Old Testament. Joseph's story starts in 36 or 37, and it goes all the way through chapter 50. There are over 13 chapters dedicated to the story of Joseph. Why is Joseph's story so long? My goodness, when I was studying, I was like, Jesus. This is a long story, and I've read it time and time again. I just never realized how long it was. It's because the story of Joseph can sum up the entire story of the Bible. Joseph has a father who loved him. And he came into this world, and God showed him what his purpose would be. And he came to the people that he was supposed to present this vision to, and they rejected him. They discarded him. They threw him away. Joseph's life takes many turns, but then there's a famine in the land. There's a curse that has cursed the entire land, and God uses Joseph in a position of power to over, uh, overcome this curse that has plagued the entire land. And he, because of Joseph's position of power, he preserves a remnant of people who are now going to go out into the world, who are going to now take what he has given them and what he's placed into them and, and, and populate the earth. And so Joseph actually is a picture. He is an echo of the future of a guy named Jesus. 
of a guy who's going to step into history and people are going to reject him. And the curse that the enemy has, has over us. We are under the curse, but he comes to overthrow the curse. And through his death, his burial, and his resurrection, he's going to get to a place of power where he's going to say that what the enemy meant for evil, God is going to turn around for your good. And he's going to rise with all power and authority and victory in his hands. And this is your identity. This is your lineage. Joseph points us to Jesus, but many of us can get lost in the rejection, and we don't really see it. I want to let you know how you can overcome. How do you know that you're healed from rejection? Some of you are going, yeah, oh, that's fine, ha, 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 yelling and all that, but how do I know that I'm healed from rejection? Here's the proof. Let me give you the proof. The proof that we've been healed from rejection is whether we live from acceptance or whether we live for acceptance. I want you to write this down. Take a picture if you need to. The proof that we've been healed from rejection is whether we are living from acceptance or whether we are spending our lives in hopes to earn acceptance from other people. Y'all know that Dr. Seuss story, are you my mother, are you my mother, are you my mother? Well, many of us live our lives in a very similar way. Will you accept me? Will you accept me? What about you? Will you accept me? Do you accept me? Many of us are chasing acceptance from other people, not realizing that the, re- the, the way that we're supposed to heal from, it, from rejection is to understand that we've already been accepted by God. We've already been accepted by God. And this is so good, y'all. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. I need you to see this. And I don't know about y'all. I might shout. I might rejoice. Just bear with me for a second. I'm going to try to contain it. But it's so good to me. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. I want to park right here for a moment. Even before the world was made, God made a decision about you. You didn't even have an opportunity to sin yet. You didn't even have an opportunity to do the thing that you did years ago, to do the thing that you did last week, to do the thing that you did last night or 10 minutes ago. God decided some things about you before he made the world, and he decided that he was going to love you. He decided that he was going to choose you. He said God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And I love this part, y'all. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Those of you who felt like even when you received a form of acceptance, it felt like it was a burden to them. Sometimes you feel like a burden to other people. I need you to know something about God. He's not like man. He wanted you. He decided in advance, and it gave him great pleasure. He wasn't like, oh, I guess I got to accept them now. Will you get your act together? Come on. I'm accepting you. Dang, what else do you want? That wasn't his attitude and disposition. He said it gave him great pleasure. He said, come here, my son. Come here, my daughter. I love you. I'm choosing you. I want you, and you bring me great pleasure and joy. Come here, my daughter. Come here, my son. My arms are wide open. I love you. I'm choosing you. I want you, and you bring me great joy. The devil wants to tell you the opposite. The devil wants to tell you that this whole thing that we do is all about religion and rules and regulations. But the gospel of Jesus wants to convey a completely different message. The gospel of Jesus says this, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault 
in his eyes. Four affirmations that I want to give you today so that you can live from God's acceptance. I really want you to get this in your heart, and I want you to give this to your children. I want you to give this to your children's children. I want this, I want Ephesians 1, 3, and 5 to become a life first for you. If you're struggling with rejection, this is how you overcome. This is how you live from acceptance. I want everyone to say this. God loves me. God chose me. God wants me. And God is pleased with me. If, that, if you receive that today, come on, stand on your feet and let's say it together. God loves me. God chose me. God wants me. And God is pleased with me. Some of y'all need to get a little stank with it. Put a little attitude on it. God loves me. God chose me. God wants me. And God is pleased with me. Tell it until the devil gets mad. God loves me. God chose me. God wants me. And he is pleased with me. I don't care what the devil said. I don't care what that person said. I don't care who rejected you. He loves you. He chose you. He wants you. And he is pleased with you. Somebody give him praise today. I love how, how Paul opens up Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. He says, all oh, praise to God. All oh, praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing because we're united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Pay attention whose eyes? Doesn't always mean that you're going to be without fault in people's eyes. Some people are going to look at you with judgment. Some people are going to look at you with disapproval and rejection. Some people are going to throw you away and discard you and abandon you. Whose eyes? His eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family, bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure to do it. Maybe you've said to yourself, but I just can't get over it. <laughs> because it wasn't just a friend that rejected me. It was a person that I was supposed to receive love and acceptance from. It was a mom who rejected me. It was a father who abandoned me. David says something in Psalms 27. He, he says this. He says, he says, my father and mother walked out and left me, but God took me in. Whoever you are, your father abandoned you. Your mother walked out on you. And even if it wasn't physically through their actions, you felt that sense of rejection. But I need you to hear something today. God is here ready to take you in. God is, has, has his arms open and he's ready to take you in. And God has taken you in and he's saying, I love you, my son and my daughter. You are not alone. Not for a minute will God forsake you. You've cried many tears over this. And some of you, you've gotten to a place to where you're strong enough that you've buried it so deep that you're numb. You don't feel anything. But it wasn't always that way. At first, it really impacted you. This is not on the screen. I want you to just hear this. Psalms 56 and 8 says this about God. It says, you keep track of all my sorrows. God is keeping track of everything that pained you, of all the heartache, all the disappointment. God is keeping track of all of your sorrows. It says, you have collected all my tears in your bottle. You thought your tears were falling to the ground. But God is collecting every tear that you have shed over this rejection. And he's saying, I'm not letting a single tear hit the ground because I'm with you and I'm here to show you my faithfulness. The devil wants to use this to harm you. 
I want to take that rejection and I want to work it out for your good. Here's the last thing I want to leave you with today. Since God has accepted you, when will you accept you? <laughs> 